Well, one of the interesting side aspects to come out of our response to COVID is the role of the Australian Defence Force in supporting state governments in their closure of borders and in enforcing hotel quarantine. We've also seen the ADF involved in support operations during extreme weather events like the bushfires. Tonight, I'm going to talk with ANU Strategic and Defence Studies Centre, Professor John Blaxland, who happens to be an old mate of mine and worked in an adjacent office with me uh, for a number of years when we were both in the Army some years back, when we were both a lot younger, I might add. John, great to see you. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for joining us in the studio. Great to be here with you. Yeah. Well, look, you've written a couple of important pieces about this uh, because setting the scene, I think many of our viewers would... Uh, always love to see our men and women in uniform, mm. get a sense of reassurance when they see the cams turn up as they did in Burnie or mm. turn up at a hot spot during a bushfire and so on. But there comes a cost, doesn't there, in terms of uh, deterioration of warfighting capabilities, erosion of training times, loss of uh, capability. And you have expanded on this in a couple of great papers and interviews. So would you care to share your thoughts on why you think we shouldn't get used to break glass in case of bushfire with the ADF. Yeah, thanks, Catherine. Uh, look, you're right. It's the, the ADF, uh, the, the Defence Force, everybody loves it uh, because they can do people and they rise to the occasion and they always deliver and it's invariably a good news story in Australia. Uh, and what, I, what we're finding is that they're so popular that everyone wants more of them. Mm. And that's been OK up to a point because things have happened consecutively. Yes. Um, but we're facing the prospect of actually a range of these challenges emerging concurrently. And here I'm talking about not just the prospect of fires or more pandemics, but uh, potentially a, a series of challenges in the Pacific and in Southeast Asia mm. that are relating to uh, environmental catastrophe, mm. uh, uh, governance challenges, terrorism, breakdown of law and order, transnational criminal groups, etc. And then, of course, layered on top of that is the question of great power contestation. Mm. So those, the overlap of those three areas is at a level that is unprecedented in our lifetime. Mm. It really is. And so while we have got away with thinking that the ADF is really good, mm. it's actually a boutique defence force. It's actually not that large. Correct. Uh, and, in fact, when you think about it, most people forget that the Australian Army, just the Army part of it, mm. back in 1943, mm. had 14 divisions. Yes. And today we've got one regular and one reserve. Yeah. Um, divisions. And under strength, both and of them. Under strength and both over tax. So mm. while we've... Everybody, these guys are, these are people who will happily rise to the occasion, do the best they can. Mm. But what, what we're not seeing is the price. And the price is an erosion of their operational military capability. Because mm. there's a range of activities that have had to be put on hold yep. um, for people to do basic and sophisticated training, level, a range of levels of training. You're talking formation level, aren't you? Just if you want to break exactly. that down to lay people speak what so, we're talking about. So a grouping of five to 7,000 men and women mm. in the field conducting uh, field training exercises that are very expensive to, to launch, yep. to operate, and they're done only periodically, every couple of years. Yep. Uh, and they're really important learning experiences. And if you miss out... They don't come you, around. It has, it has a knock-on consequence on mm. careers and on the capability of the Defence Force holistically. Absolutely. Um, so we won't see the effect of this necessarily mm. until we face a crisis. And, of course, by then it's too late to do much about it. Absolutely. Now, the kinds of things we're talking about, aren't, aren't we, are the loss of combined arms skills, for example, to, to be able to orchestrate your tank, artillery, infantry, vertical envelopment using air and so on. Mm. You're not doing that kind of training because bits and pieces of the force are distributed around the country and mm. it's breaking that up, as I understand your argument. That's right. And, and there's a view out there that, oh, well, do we really need those capabilities? Yeah. Well, the bottom line is that it's the ADF is like an core insurance business. policy. That's our core business. It's core business um, and, it's those, as you say, it's like break, break glass in emergency. This is not something that you pull out and just use... Uh, for dusting down the cupboards. Mm. Uh, it, it's actually a really important capability that uh, that is very uh, has to be invested in and you have to work on, on maintaining those honed skills that are actually quite expensive and quite difficult and tricky to maintain mm. uh, if we're going to make, make sure that the ADF 
is ready for a range of contingencies that, let's face it, could arise at fairly short notice. And I noticed you, uh, you welcomed the government's strike package on 1 July, the PM announcing that at the Australian Defence Force Academy. You mm. welcomed the, the enhanced ability to hit further away from home and hit harder. Mm. That's a sign of a deterioration in our strategic environment. So we can't have air crew running around fighting bushfires, can we? We've got to be facing north and getting our best game ready. Well, what's happened is that we've, we've relied on the Defence Force because it's been quick and easy and it's been good for PR. Mm. Um, and yet we have a range of other bodies out there that are actually, actually best suited for the job. So I'm talking here Rural Fire Service, State Emergency Services, uh, State and Federal Police Forces, uh, other volunteer agencies. Um, there's a range of institutions that are actually the best ones placed to do this work, but they're under-resourced. Yeah. Um, and I think there's a, a need for us to think about how we're going to resource them appropriately yes. if we are going to face all these challenges in a more concurrent way rather than a consecutive fashion. Now, there's another important point that we discussed earlier as well, and that is the legal status of our people when mm. they're out doing these tasks. Mm. I'm old enough, sadly, to have been involved in the barrel call-out right. straight after graduation from RMC, and you'll remember we had armed troops in the streets of Barrel after the Hilton bombing. Mm. But the ambiguities Featured around this... Featured in my this, ASIO, Volume 3, Volume Terrific. <laughs> you remember it. February 13, 1978. Indeed. But the, the, there is an important point, is there not? If we're using troops to enforce COVID quarantine in hotels mm. or contact tracing, mm. they are trespassing, aren't they, if they go onto civilian property without a police officer? Well, prison. that's the problem, isn't it? Because yeah. people think that the ADF, when it gets called out, is there to just to lend a helping hand. Mm. But there's two categories of call-out for the Defence Force, and most people don't quite get the distinction. And can you explain that? Because that's important. It's really Yeah, vital. so there's Defence Aid to the Civil Community, which is glad-handing, no weapons, but pitching in with, with, uh, with buckets and, and shovels and, and helping people sandbag against a storm. Uh, and then there's Defence Aid to the Civil Power, which is the authority, which is, a, which is about the use of force. And here we're talking about the use of weapons. Yes. And that's usually reserved for... Terrorist-related incidents. Yeah. Lent siege, for example, Lent when we siege, had the tag on uh, standby. The barrel incident yeah. back in 1978 and so on. Um, but the ADF is not actually trained to be police. They're not trained to be SES either. Mm. So you've got to be careful about what you ask the ADF to do. Indeed. Um, it's, it's, good, it's good at helping mm. and it's good at war fighting. Uh, but actually asking it to do something in between is not where it's trained and it's not where its core skills are. Yes. And it's also a legal twilight zone. It is, isn't it? And it's it? problematic. It's mm. potentially hugely problematic. If we are expecting the Defence Force to be placed in a position where they are required to exercise police-like powers, mm. they're not legally covered to do that. Absolutely. And that's a huge hesitation around this. I don't think most Australians would understand it. For instance, if we, if we did, as was contemplated in Victoria go with it with the police to, say, enter a property to check whether someone's breaching quarantine, mm. the soldier, sailor, airman, airwoman would not be allowed to enter that property without the consent of the owner and have no powers of arrest. Which is one of the great things. Uh, Lieutenant General John Fruin, who's been heading yeah. the Joint Task Force on this, he's been going around telling people, you, if you want the ADF, you want them in conjunction with the police mm. or the emergency service, but don't just get, rely on the ADF for this very reason. Mm. It's a real legal problem. Uh, potential, uh, you know, uh, minefield. Absolutely. Couldn't have got a better leader for that role, by the way, given that he'd mm. been at ASD and spanned whole-of-government operations. Mm. He was skilled enough to recognise that there are legal issues about use of uh, ADF assets on Australian soil. So a terrific pick, frankly. Mm. John, look, we've got... Uh, there's other stuff I want to run through with you today. There's a wild card that mm. uh, I didn't give you notice of, but... Uh, breaking news was President Trump awarded the Legion of Merit to mm. our Prime Minister, and while I'm delighted on his behalf, something of an unusual award, I would have thought, a Legion of Merit. Pretty it's a, unusual, yeah. yeah. Now, it's happened before. Robert Menzies, I understand, got one. Did he? Yep. Um, and, it, and it's not just to our Prime Minister, but to the Prime Minister of uh, Japan and uh, India. Mm. So this is really a statement Part of about the Quad. The quad. This mm. is a statement about the Quad. And it's a statement by an outgoing president who is politically aligned mm. with these leaders. They're all conservatives. Yes. They're, so this is, I think, a statement of affirmation from President Trump. Yes. There's a real question now whether or not President the President-elect Biden would follow a similar line. Yeah. And and I suspect this is partly Trump messaging. Um, this is for domestic. 
American consumption, yeah. don't screw with the quad. Yeah. Uh, I suspect that's what it is. And I suspect also that uh, a, a Biden presidency may not be all that thrilled about what, what you know, this deal that's been uh, handed to them. Do you uh, think they're getting a they're bit, since out. they're getting tied to the chariot wheels, as it were, by the outgoing? Yeah, now I don't get a sense that uh, the Biden administration is likely to walk away from the quad, mm. but I don't see that there'll be the same warmth there, simply... Well, a couple of reasons, but one of which is that they're not political bedfellows. They're mm. not. They're not. They're not. All, they're not going to be conservatives. Biden is a Democrat. He's not a Republican. Uh, the other, the, you know, the Quad counterparts are all conservatives. They've been, you know, to a certain extent, fellow travellers of the Republicans, mm. um, and that's clearly changing now. Yes. What a loss Shinzo Abe is looking like with hindsight, though. Wasn't he now, you now realise, a granite figure in this configuration around the Indo-Pacific? I think we'll miss him with hindsight. Look, he was uh, clearly a strong advocate for uh, the free and open Indo-Pacific. Mm. The Americans took it on. Uh, he, you're right, he really has been a leading light. Um, it'll be interesting to see how much uh, Japan and India follow through with that, uh, that mindset. Mm. Uh, my sense is that, you know, there are some fundamental shifts, uh, tectonic plates shifting, if you like, that are probably going to mean that even though a Biden presidency isn't all that well disposed because of their own political inclination to support mm. Japan or uh, India or, for that matter, Australia, I suspect there's now greater imperative for the Biden administration yes. to follow through. That's important. Uh, uh, the, because the shift is so significant, yeah. the consequences are now far more grave uh, and the stakes are that much higher and the United States position is that much weaker and it therefore is now in a position where if it wants to assert itself in the Indo-Pacific, these three partners, amongst others, but these three ones stand out as the leading ones for America's uh, engagement in the Pacific, which is one of the reasons why I think Australia is such a, such a target these days for the, the wolf warrior diplomacy, the yeah. sharp power, which yeah. we've seen manifest over beef, barley, coal, etc. And I guess double-header to end this session, how long do you think that... Uh, I spoke to Dennis Richardson at a Minerals Council forum and he thought we could be in the freezer for a couple of years. Mm. Would you agree with that? And then what's, I want to ask you one question as a strategic thinker mm. and a man who's been across the entire Australian intelligence community, both as an operator and also an historian. What is the one global scenario, other than the pandemic, that mm. keeps you awake at night? What worries you? What do you think the Armageddon scenario is? I'm worried about Taiwan. <laughs> Me too. Mm. I thought you might say that. I mm. Cross Straits operation to coincide with the... 100th anniversary of the PLA, perhaps? Or? Yeah, so what I think we're seeing is um, China has been, you know, exercising that wonderful ac uh, uh, ac uh, statement from uh, General Sun Tzu, uh, the acme of skill is to defeat one's adversary without fighting. Yeah. But it's been building its defence capabilities, building a French Navy every year... Yes. ..to the point where I think it's getting close to being comfortable to taking on the West. 